Hi, welcome to the Builder's House. Uh, in this video, uh, it's going to be a kind of a continuation of my first two videos, uh, which were uh, my journey out of Christianity, parts one and two. And today I'd like to talk a little bit more about the Bible itself and uh, the book when I was in Abrahamic religion, I called my final authority for what I call truth. So this was a belief, uh, like I had said in my earlier videos, that I really clung to through the years that kept me in Abrahamic religion for so long. And so yeah, that's just what I want to discuss here in this video, uh, why I no longer believe the Bible to be the Word of God uh, or an infallible text that proclaims the message of the Creator. So um, there's a lot of information out there that a person uh, can access online and a lot of books that, um, that I've read through the years uh, written on this very issue. So um, a few of them that I've looked at, I'm just going to put them up real quick and uh, you're welcome to look at them. This is one that I recently got. And uh, so, yeah, I have uh, quite a few books that, uh, that I've read. But um, this one here, I want to discuss a little bit. I just recently got that uh, so a little while ago and that I've been looking at. And this one by uh, D.M. Murdoch. She's a pretty good author. She's got very solid information. And uh, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to give four reasons why I do not believe the Bible is the infallible word of God. Uh, so this is a pretty extensive study. Um, I'm not going to get into a big, long series of videos here. I just want to do one video. And uh, it would literally take dozens of videos um, if uh, I went into all the things that I've looked at these last four years. And uh, as I said in my last videos, many other subjects that I've looked at as well. So it's just gonna be a summary basically that um, some of the things that convinced me uh, through the research I've done. So um, number one is the way the Bible came into existence. So when I was coming out of religion, um, one of the questions that I seriously pondered was, who decided what text should be called the Bible? And did these councils of mere men have the creator's stamp of approval to do such a thing? And the Bible is not one book. Most of you probably know that. It's not written by one or two people. It's a collection of multiple texts that in that time period uh, were looked at during the process of uh, deciding what should become the canon, as they say. Um, what would be considered approved or not approved to be put in what we know today as the Bible. So. The question that went through my mind many times is who had the authority uh, to say this text or that text would be put into the canon and called the Word of God uh, and then say it was divinely inspired, infallible, things like this. So <clears throat> that's one of the first things that went through my mind as I was really questioning a lot of uh, my belief structure. and. Keep in mind, I had already come out of Christianity at this time, and I was into Messianic Judaism. So, um, just moving forward here, and to add to this, um, why would a creator who, according to Christianity and Messianic Judaism both, which were the groups I was involved with uh, through the years, um, a creator who is supposed to be perfect, uh, he's supposed to be flawless, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, and use a group like the Roman Catholic Church 
to bring his great divine message to all humanity. So that's another question I, I greatly pondered after reading a lot of the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I have nothing against Christians or Roman Catholics, you know, Protestants, or any other people for, for that matter. I'm speaking about the religion. So keep that in mind as I continue my video here. I'm not speaking against any person. Um, I'm looking at the doctrines and the teachings of these religions. So um, I'll get into more, you know, later on uh, about the religion. Um, specifically the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, but uh, the evil acts that were committed, and not just at the beginning in an effort to spread what they call the good news, um, but throughout history, and it's pretty diabolical. So, um, just these things in themselves really brought me to seriously question the authenticity of the Bible. Um, number two, and I just want to keep on track, I don't want to make this video too long, um, the historic accuracy of the Bible. So a lot of the supposed history of the Bible is not consistent with a known history which has preserved records and documented proof. Uh, such as were found in other cultures, ancient texts, which long predated what we know as Bible texts. So I realize that not all the history uh, here in North America, uh, where I went to school, uh, is not exactly the way they present it to be. Uh, but still, many of the archaeological findings and ancient texts are proof for me that um, that really debunk the alleged history of Bible records. Uh, things within the Bible stories, such as the Kingdom of Israel with Saul, David, Solomon, uh, the times of the assumed judges and the prophets. Uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies with dates, places, and names, um, such as the Battle of Jericho, for example. And like I said, it's a big read, you know, a person can, you know, read about this kind of thing for, for months. And uh, there's a lot of books out there and things that are available now that weren't when I uh, first came out of Christianity and started looking into some of these things. Um, I want to make a few co quotes here. Um, let's see, just to kind of... Um, Okay, so I'm going to quote from this book here, which I've been looking at. Very interesting. It's a very, um, it's just, just tons of information. It's a big book, and uh, she's got a lot of really great quotes. So I'm going to, I just marked off a couple here. Um, so biblical scholars have long known that all the books of the Hebrew Bible were written long after the events that were purported to describe, and that the Bible as a whole was produced by composite writers and editors in a long and exceedingly complex uh, literary process which stretched over a thousand years. And um, that's from Dr. William Denver in Who Were the Early Israelites and Where Did They Come From? Uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries, the voices became louder, which contested the traditional view that the Pentateuch, uh, which are the first five books of Moses, um, in its entirety had been written by Moses. Scholars pointed to numerous passages which seemed to reflect events, customs, etc., of periods after Moses. Among other things, it was time and again pointed out that Moses could not possibly have described his own death uh, in Deuteronomy 34. And that was uh, by Dr. Paul Sanders, the province of Deuteronomy. Uh, moving forward here, no direct connections have been found between the abundant documentary evidence from the ancient Near East 
for the second millennium and the biblical narrative of Israel's ancestors and origins found in the first seven books of the Bible. As a result, it is impossible to determine whether or not the individuals and events described in the Bible existed, and if they did, when they should be dated. Okay, the story of Moses is contained in the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch or Torah, consisting of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as noted. According to many people uh, who still believe that the Bible is a monolithic product of the Almighty God himself, infallibility recorded by the authors purported. The evidence indicates that Moses was not the writer of the Pentateuch, as maintained by tradition. Like several books of the New Testament as well, Various other Old Testament texts are pseudographical. In other words, they were not written by those whose names they appear. Also, like the New Testament over the centuries, the texts of the Old Testament were redacted many times, which is to say they were edited, mutilated, and forged. So... Yeah, she, she quotes from many, many sources. It's not just her opinions here in these books that she writes, um, D.M. Murdoch. So, um, okay, so I'm going to do one more quote from this book. Um, it's page 33, uh, No Archaeological Evidence. The unreal air of the Pentateuch is obvious also from the lack of archaeological evidence which continues to elude discovery despite numerous efforts to find it over a period of centuries to millennia. Concerning this mythical appearance, lay Egyptologist Gerald Massey, 1828-1907, remarks, As history, the Pentateuch has neither head, tail, or vertebrae. It is an indistinguishable mush of myth and mystery. Had it been a real history, Palestine and Judea ought to have been found overstrewn with implements of warfare work, both of the Hebrew manufacture and of the conquered races, whereas outside the book, it is a blank. The lack, I mean, I'm sorry, the land of a people so rich that King David, in his poverty, could collect 1,000 millions of pounds sterling towards building a temple, is found without art, sculptures, bronzes, pottery, or precious stones to illustrate the truth of the Bible story of a nation of warriors and spoilers of nations who burst away from their captivity in Egypt, two million strong, nor will the proofs be found, not if Palestine be uprooted in the search." And it just goes on. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, a lot of uh, archaeological evidence and um, many, many sources one can refer to. So um, that's the Old Testament, as they say it. Uh, the names of the books, when we get into the New Testament, such as the four Gospels, um, they were not the authors of these books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So it makes you wonder, you know, with all the texts back then, it wasn't just, you know, a few texts and then they compiled it into a, you know, what we know as the Bible. It was hundreds and hundreds of texts that uh, these councils of men worked with and then decided, you know, we're going to put this in and that one's not approved. So like I said at the beginning, um, what gave them the authority to do such a thing and then call it infallible word of God. So I'm going to quote one more from one more book. And this is this book here, the Christ conspiracy. So, um, okay. Um, this is uh, getting into history, talking about the history, um, as page 25. Okay, while the masses are led to believe that the Christian religion was founded by a historical wonder worker and his devoted eyewitnesses, and it's speaking what they say, Jesus Christ, or as Messianics say, Yeshua, um, 
and his devoted eyewitnesses who accurately wrote down the events of his life and ministry in a marvelous book that became God's Word. The reality is that none of the Gospels was written by its purported author, and indeed no mention of any New Testament text can be found in writings prior to the beginning of the second century of the Common Era, CE, long after, after the purported events. These holy books, so to speak, then are so revered by devotees, turn out to be spurious, and since it is in them that we find the story of Christ, we must be doubtful as to its validity. Um, regarding the canonical Gospels, Wayless states, the Gospels are all priestly forgy, forgeries over a century after their pretended dates. As said by the great critic Salomon Reynach, with the exception of Papias, who speaks of a narrative by Mark and a collection of sayings of Jesus, no Christian writer of the first half of the second century uh, up to 150 AD quotes the Gospels or their reputed authors. So um, Bronson Keeler, in a short history of the Bible, concurs, they are not heard of until 150 AD, that is, till Jesus had been dead nearly 120 years. No writer before 150 AD makes the slightest mention of them. So, um, quote number two, um, on page 34, uh, it says, it is clear that the epistles, and that's um, not the Gospels, that's the writings of Paul and, and so on, um, do not demonstrate historical Jesus and are not as early as they are pretended to be, written or edited by a number of hands over several decades during the second century, and that the historical Jesus apparently was not even known until that late period, as it is also evidenced. These texts were further mutilated over the centuries. So, as we're seeing here, it's just changes, you know, uh, translations and uh, into different languages, and also through many of those who copied the text. They didn't have um, what we do now with the printing technology and so on. You know, they had to copy and um, translate. And so with all the changes over the centuries and centuries, and then still to claim that it's an infallible word of a God, for me, that really puts a really big flag, red flag up. So, um, let's see, I'm just going to do one more quote. <laughs> I mean, I could read here all day, but, um, okay. Um, Christianity was thus fervently resisted wherever it invaded. And it's talking here about, um, the belief structures of m the societies, uh, before Christianity came on the scene. Um, when Christianity came, they came to convert and to change the people's uh, beliefs. And uh, there's a lot a person can read about that too, which is extremely, um, it's, it's very diabolical, like I said. Um, as nation after nation died under the sword fighting it off because its doctrines and proponents were repugnant and blasphemous. Some of the barbarians, so-called, who resisted Christianity were actually far more advanced than those who followed what the pagans considered a vulgar ideology. For example, the, I the Irish Finians, whose rule was never to insult women, were said to have gone to hell for denying Christian anti-feminist doctrines. When the great idea threats of hell and other sweet talk failed to impress the pagans, the Christian conspirators began turning the screws by establishing laws banning pagan priests, holidays, and superstitions. 
Pagans were barred from being palace guards or holding civil and military office. Their properties and temples were destroyed or confiscated, and people who practiced what Christians called idolatry or sacrifices were put to death. As Charles Waite says in History of the Christian Religion to the Year 200, under Constantine and his sons, commissions had been issued against heretics, as they called them, especially against the Donatists who were visited with the most rigorous punishment. And it just goes on and on saying that um, they hunted these people down and they either made them convert or they were tortured, killed. Um, it, it's very, very scary uh, thinking about what people went through at that time. So um, as I just continued doing my research, you know, over the, the months and the years, um, I found that the Bible is just riddled with fraudulence. And this brings me to point three.